I am very excited. Um, although I may not sound it because I feel a little bit sick, I'm really excited over the next uh, six services that we are together uh, because we're going to be talking about many things that are very important to each and every one of us, but nudge your neighbor and say the core. Nudge your other neighbor and say the core. Now, in any, in any religion, in any group, in any sport, really, there is a, a set of, of principles or doctrines or laws or rules that people abide by and live by according to the group or religion that they are a part of. And Christians are no different, and then Christian denominations, broken down into different denominations based on beliefs or uh, interpretations of what they feel the Bible is saying, uh, preach or teach different things to their, to their members. And we call these things core doctrines, typically. Doctrine being a set of beliefs that people believe due to religion or political, etc. And so it can be often uh, said or or it can be often exemplified that sometimes, especially if you have, have grown up in church, um, that we don't always do a great job about teaching or talking about the things we are supposed to do. It's just implied that we do them. Have you ever felt like that before? It's that it doesn't necessarily, at least at the beginning, come with an expl explanation. It's more, here's what we do, and we don't always do a great job at explaining why we do those things. Show of hands if you've ever felt like that growing up in church before. And so it's important to understand for each and every one of us not just what we're supposed to do, but, but why we're doing it. And so we are going to be exploring and talking about different subjects uh, about Christianity and through the Bible and about the Bible, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, that we would call core doctrine of the apostolic church. Now, tonight, we are going to talk about the Bible. Everybody say the Bible. And we're going to talk about why what some people would call the good book isn't just another good book. It's not just a religious book for a certain group of people, but we are going to explore and hopefully give understanding to each and every one of us about why the Bible uh, is, is special. It's different than other religious books and why it has really held the test of time and how we still have the Bible some 2,000 years later, uh, some, uh, even a little bit longer than that in some instances. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, we're going to look at the Bible and the reliable history that we have to confirm that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And we are going to get understanding of how we can know and how we can trust the Bible. This is really uh, step one. Uh, if you've got a friend that needs a Bible study or they don't know anything about Christianity, can I tell you that if you sat down with them and tried to teach them the Bible without first asking them if they believe that the Bible is true or at least could be true, you're not going to get very far. So this is really the fundamental level because if you don't believe or understand what the Bible says, then why would you believe anything that comes off the pages? It's kind of common sense. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The Bible, the Scripture, it was inspired by God. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. It literally means that the Bible is God-breathed. It is as if God breathed his life into the Bible, into those pages, and into those words, making the Bible that you have in your very hands the literal word of God. Many men have written the Bible, but God authored the Bible. Say that again. Many men have written the Bible, but God authored the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 22, it tells us how the Bible came to us. God, he inspired men to write, and they took the words that God was speaking to them, and they applied their pen to paper to write down the word of God. Some skeptics will argue that the Bible was only written by men, and therefore, because it's just written by men who are not perfect, we, we fail and we fall and we make mistakes, we shouldn't believe it. But the tr it is true that the Bible was written. Everybody say written. It was written by men, but it was authored by God. 
God inspired these men. God would speak to these men. He would give them visions. He would give them dreams. He would give them commands. He would give them prophecy. And then they would take pen to paper or papyrus and feather and ink and whatever they had in their day. And they would write down what God was inspiring them to write down. Now, prophecies, they are one of the greatest proofs that the Bible is not just another good book. All of these prophecies were made and fulfilled in and by Jesus Christ. There's going to be a few on the screen behind me. Here are a few prophecies in the Bible that we see uh, came to pass. Jesus would be born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah chapter 5 verse 2 and Matthew chapter 2 verse 6. Jesus would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Think about how specific that is. Think that it names the number of the item that will be traded, and think that it also names the item that will be traded. 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, and we see that happen in Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. It says that Jesus would be pierced. That's Zechariah 12, verse 10, and we see that in John chapter 19, verse 34. It says that Jesus' executioners would gamble For his garments, kind of a random thing, kind of a random thing that somebody all the way in the Old Testament would say, here is going to be this man, the savior of the world, and they're going to kill him. And then when they're done, they're going to roll dice and figure out who gets to keep his clothes. But that was in the Bible. We see it, Psalm chapter 22, verse 18, and then it happened in Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. It said that none of Jesus' bones would be broken, Psalm chapter 34, verse 20. And we see this in John chapter 19, verse 36. It said that Jesus would be buried with the rich. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. And Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 to 60. And then it said Jesus would rise from the grave. That's Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. And Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 to 6. Now, some of these are very specific. You could say that some of these are maybe a little bit more vague than others. Some of these are obviously um, miracles that we couldn't have predicted, a.k.a. Jesus rising from the grave, or even just the thought that all of the torment and the suffering and punishment that Jesus would go through, that not a bone in his body would be broken. There is very great intricacy and detail into what the Scripture tells us, and we see these prophecies come to fulfillment. Now, Could these prophecies have been just very good, very lucky guesses? The probability of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies in similarity to the ones that we just went through is one in like 10 with like 26 zeros behind it. Do we have that number on the screen? You see that number? The probability of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies like this is one in whatever that number is. I don't know what this number is, but it's really big. Look at your neighbor say, it's really big. Okay, so what we have to understand is that the prophets, they weren't just guessing. It would, like, it's like as close to impossible as you could get without maybe adding a few more zeros, which I don't even know what you would have to do or what that number would be, but they weren't just guessing. These men of the Old Testament were inspired by God. God would speak to them or he would show them things and they would write it down and we see those things come to pass and some of them so unique and so interesting and some of them miraculous. Now, looking at this number, uh, if you're like me, you're saying, well, like, what does that even mean, right? Like, what's the difference between that number and cutting three zeros off or whatever? It's, it's really hard for us to, to kind of visualize the odds of what this is. So some people have actually tried to make this understandable and like just to be super clear, uh, I don't know how they got to this number and I'm not sure what math would go and be involved in creating a number such as this. But to visualize it, okay, let's say you took uh, toonies, okay? Let's say you took toonies, like the money, the coin, and you covered basically the whole province of Alberta, okay? Everybody with me? You got toonies? You got enough toonies to cover the whole province of Alberta. You are rich, okay? Now, you're going to take all of those toonies, and you are going to cover the entire province of Alberta. Like, you're going to lay them in circles until the whole province is covered. But you are going to paint one toonie red. Everybody with me? 
You've got Alberta, you've got Toonies everywhere, and in, in the middle somewhere, in the mountains or in the valley or in the water, I don't know where, but you paint one Toonie red and then you hide it. And then you go and find a blind person and ask them to go find the red Toonie. You with me? And they pick it first try. They wander the province, and they follow the leading of the Spirit. And somehow, this blind person picks up the red toonie in Alberta among all the millions or billions of toonies that there is. That is like kind of like the odds of eight prophecies happening to one man like we just covered. It's kind of radical. Look at your neighbor and say, it's kind of radical. Now, history, not just, not just what we have talked about thus far, but history confirms that the Bible... Uh, or has proof that the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is actually remarkably accurate in its history. The Bible was written on three different continents. And the Bible was written by nearly 40 different men. These continents were Asia, Africa, and Europe. And some scholars believe that Moses wrote part of the Pentateuch, which is the beginning books of the Old Testament, in Egypt on the continent of Africa. The Bible was written by nearly 40 men, and these men were as different as the books that they wrote. Among the authors within the Bible, the ones that wrote down the words, there were kings, poets, shepherds, prisoners, pastors, fishermen, a doctor, a tax collector, musicians, and so on. Their professions, what they did in their professional life for work, as well as their personalities, were marked differently from each other. Yet their messages, think of this, 40 different authors from various different upbringings and and socioeconomic statuses. Some were rich and some were poor and some were poets and some were tax collectors, some wrote music, some were kings. These are really, uh, this is a broad range of people. Yet somehow these 40 men wrote down the God-inspired word that we're talking about tonight, the Bible, and they did it to complement each other rather than contradict each other. Think about that. They don't contradict each other. Matter of fact, they, they um, complement each other's writings. And above that, these people wrote the Bible over the span of about 1,600 years. Think about this. They didn't know each other. It's not like it was a group of 40 people that lived in the same place. Like some of them were dead for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before another person wrote something that got added to the Bible. They didn't know each other, yet somehow they complimented and did not contradict what they wrote down. Think back 1,600 years ago. It would be like four, whatever it is, 423. That's a weird thing to think about. Like we're not even four digits. What do we have today that people 1,600 years ago didn't have? Well, the answer is like everything. Like they didn't have anything. They were writing these things down with feathers dipped in ink on papyrus. They didn't even have paper. They didn't have cars. They had ponies, okay? They had papyrus and ponies. Look at your neighbor say papyrus and ponies. Think about it. Think about how difficult it would be to write a book that would be as relevant in 1,600 years as it was the day that you wrote about it. And now, think about how difficult it would be to keep nearly 40 authors, 40 different people from writing it down and not contradicting one another. Yet, the Bible is remarkably relevant for us and does not contradict itself. The Bible was written in three different languages. These languages were Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Yet, even among the translations, yet even among the difference in speech and word, nothing was lost in translation. The Bible was written in several different genres. The Bible has history, poetry, romance, narrative, personal letters, proverbs, mysteries, and so on. The Bible is also remarkably specific, even naming people before they were born. God is not afraid of specifics. It's not that we are talking about a book that it's like, there will be this guy, and he's going to be born in North America, right? And his name is going to start with the letter A. And someday he will be 29, and it is Alex. He is here tonight. Like, the Bible is not that vague. The Bible is actually very specific. 
God, he promised Abraham a son, and he told him when he would be born and what to name him. He prophesied the name of Israel's deliverer, which was Cyrus, a century before he was born. He promised Israel. He told the name of Israel's deliverer before that guy was born and said him by name, and then it came to be. Think about one man beginning to write a book and nearly 40 others trying to finish it 16 centuries later. If it wasn't the word of God, it would be filled with contradictions and inconsistencies. Yet the Bible is miraculously consistent all throughout because the Bible is the word of God. Did you know that both the Old Testament and the New Testament were written without chapters and verses? There was no such divisions in the writing initially. Now, we, as history has gone on, have, have put those in there to try and make sense and break it up, but, but there was no chapter in verses. And what's also interesting about the Bible is it's not just a, a feel-good story and it's all this good stuff and none of this bad stuff, but the Bible, it actually reveals the mistakes and the sins of all of its heroes that are mentioned. So think about your favorite Bible character, if you have one. Uh, you could think about it, and you could actually probably find in the Scripture what their you know, individual fault was because they were all imperfect. For example, if we look at David, he committed adultery and murder. Paul, he murdered Christians. Peter denied the Lord. Moses cursed the rock, and so on. The Bible doesn't uh, shrink back or try to hide uh, revealing the flaws of these heroes. God is not afraid to show that his people have fallen, but by his grace, they got back up. Now, when we talk about the Bible, the question concerning what to include in the Bible is called, this, is, this might be a new word for some of you, canonicity. Look at your neighbor and say, canonicity. That is C-A-N-O-N-I-C-I-T-Y. Canonicity. And I don't want to lose you here, but this is important for us to understand. Because if we think back 1,600 years ago or even further... The Bible wasn't the only book being written. Makes sense, right? There were other people writing other things. Think about all of the people in the Old Testament that are mentioned by name in the Bible that maybe don't have anything that they wrote down included in the Bible. Think about how there was 120 people in the upper room, and most of them, the strong, strong majority of them, don't have anything that they thought about included in the Bible. They might be mentioned by proxy through somebody else's story, but the point is that there were other people there were other writers during this time period in history, but for whatever reason, their writings, as good as they may have been in some, uh, some instances, what they wrote down was not included in the Bible. Everybody say the word canon. And stay with me just for a minute here. That word, it means read. And not like reading a book, but more like a read, like a walking stick. It was a measuring rod, and it implies a, a standard. It was a metric unit that they used to measure things. And so this term, it has actually kind of worked its way into, when we talk about the Bible, to mean an official accepted list of books. The canon is the official list of books included in the Bible. Now, how many of you like to take tests? Boo. I heard a Boo. You probably don't like to take tests, but um, there needed to be some tests to make sure that the books that found their way into the Bible belong there. I'll give you a list of rules for New Testament inclusion. When we talk about the New Testament and what would be included, the Bible that we have today, here was the, the five rules that, that you can kind of chop these down into. Number one, was the book written by a man of God? Number two, was the writer confirmed by acts of God? Number three, did the message tell the story about God? Number four, does it come with the power of God? And number five, was it accepted by the people of God? And once the books passed these tests, they were included in the New Testament canon. Now, the question is, and maybe you've thought about this before, how do we know that we're not missing books? Because like we just talked about, there were other historical events and things that were being written during this time. So how do we know that what is in the Bible is everything that should be in the Bible? How do we know that something wasn't left out? Or how do we know something was put in there that shouldn't have been? Some skeptics would claim 
that we are missing books in our Bible that absolutely contradict the Bible. You can look and realize um, that our Bible is the complete Word of God that God wants us to have. Now, we're going to break this down for you to understand. The New Testament, it never quotes about anything that happened in history after the book of Malachi. Now, the book of Malachi is actually the last book in the Old Testament, so you could be saying, well, who cares? That makes sense to me, right? They don't mention anything after the book of Malachi. Um, Some books that are referenced in the Bible are themselves not in the Bible, so hear me tonight. There is a book called the book of Enoch. Has anybody ever heard of this book before? Show of hands. Book of Enoch. This is a historical book that was written during the time that the Bible was written, but it itself was not included in the Bible. There's also another book called the book of Jasher. Same thing, written during the time period, but not included in the Bible. Some people would say, well, why weren't those included, but the other books were? But just because a book is referenced in the Bible doesn't mean that it was supposed to be in the Canaan or the Old Testament or the New Testament. For example, in Acts chapter 17, Paul, he references uh, Greeks' own poets while preaching on Mars Hill. But the works of those poets are not included in the Canaan. So we see somebody in the Bible referencing writings of that time period, but those things are not in the Bible. The Bible is not like the encyclopedia of everything that ever happened ever. It's not how it works. Jesus made this statement, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. This is in Luke chapter 11, verse 51. He says, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. And this is similar to us saying from Genesis to Malachi. He's kind of making a parallel here. And so again, you're saying, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, when God ceased speaking, After the book of Malachi was written, the Old Testament was closed for good. But this is important to note. Between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament, there is actually a period of 400 years. Do you know that? The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, there is actually a gap of 400 years that goes by. Um, This is known as the silent years. And during this time, there was no word from the Lord, which is why Malachi closed out the Old Testament. There was no word from the Lord. And so there was nothing to include in those 400 years in the Bible because God was actually not speaking to his people. So there are other historical books that were written during this time, but they are not part of the Canaan. They're not part of the Bible. Some of them, like uh, Bell and the dragon, they, they tell all these tales and stories that actually contradict the Bible. Now, the test for the New Testament was whether the books uh, were written with apostolic authority. Now, Jesus, he gave Peter the keys to the kingdom, and he preached the first message of the church. He and the other disciples were among those who wrote many of the New Testament books. And so, just as it was in the Old Testament, Uh, Some historical books were written during this time, but they are not included in the New Testament. The New Testament was written and it was circulated while some of the apostles were still alive. These books that we have in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the epistles and the book of Acts of the apostles, these books were not written hundreds of years after Jesus walked the earth. These were probably in some instances actually written in real time. If you think about it, if you were uh, one of the disciples that was with Jesus and you were there when he feeds the 5,000 like, and you see this miracle and you were there and, and you saw him break the bread and you were the one that passed out the baskets and they weren't empty and there was still some left over, like, there's probably a pretty good chance you're like, I should probably go write this down. Like, this is kind of crazy. I want to write this down. I'm going to write the day and the time and the people that were there. This is incredible. And so a lot of these stories, no doubt, were written in real time as Jesus is performing these miracles. It's not that they sat down once he died. and It's like, well, what was that day and what year and, and who was there? No, they're, they're actively writing as Jesus is walking on the earth. Jesus, he worked and, and uh, talking about how Jesus worked in the parables as well that he taught. Uh, They weren't trying to remember things that happened years and and decades earlier. They were eyewitnesses, and they spread the gospel in their lifetime. And after John finished writing the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the New Testament canon, 
the New Testament books were closed. There was nothing more to add. Now, of course, whenever that happened, whatever year that was, clearly there were still historical writings, and clearly there would have been very good, very important, very spirit-filled writings that were still going on after this moment, but they were not included in the Bible for a reason. Now, another thing you may be thinking, and I will close here in just a couple minutes, is how did the Bible get here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later and how do we know that things weren't misinterpreted how do we know that things weren't written down in error how do we know that people didn't try to uh, you know manipulate it and change it as they were writing out because clearly they didn't have printing presses when people again like we talked about they have papyrus and if they were there with Jesus they're writing this out on their own accord and it's not like they put it in a printer and printed off 50 and started giving it to people next time they went to Jerusalem If you wanted to share these things, you had to rewrite them. This was uh, very time intensive. And not only that, not everybody even had the skill to write. We all have the privilege where we grow up in an education system where we learn to read and write and spell. But they didn't all have that. They had people called scribes. Everybody say the scribes. Now, just as there were tests to, to determine what books would be included in the Old Testament and New Testament, there was also a very stringent set of rules for the scribes copying the scripture. Uh, There's a gentleman by the name of Josh McDowell, and he wrote a book talking about this, and it was called The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And he listed these things when it came to what the scribes had to do. Number one, each sheet of papyrus was measured with exact guidelines. The lettering had exact rules and shapes. No two letters were allowed to touch. Can I tell you right now, I would fail as a scribe. My letters touch, I just wanted to let you know, okay? But their letters, they had exact rules and shapes. No two letters were allowed to touch, and all the letters were spaced by exactly a hair. How do you do that? I don't know either. So clearly the Bible is a lie, because we can't believe this. I'm just kidding. Not a single letter was to be written, hear me tonight, not a single letter, not word, letter, was to be written from memory. Every word was to be looked at and pronounced aloud before writing. Hi, H-I. Okay, next word. Can you imagine how labor and time intensive this would have been? Uh, To write the name of the Lord, the pen had to be cleaned. The scribe had to be consecrated, and he was not to respond to a distraction even if a king addressed him. If a scribe was writing the name of the Lord, and the king walked in and said, run out here right now, we're all going to die, he'd be like, "Mm, mm, mm, I got to write it down. Don't interrupt me. Next one. If more than three marks had to be corrected, the entire sheet of parchment was to be condemned. If they made more than three corrections on the page, they would have to take it and destroy it and throw it in the fire so that somebody else would not get a hold of it and somehow see the mistake and begin to translate it a different way. At the end of each sheet, every word and every letter was to be counted. The scribes knew the exact middle word, even letter, in every book. And at the end of the 5th century, the scribes worked in the presence, among all these other things, they worked in the presence of a proofreader who checked each word before proceeding. So again, you're copying down the word high. You have to read it. You have to say hi. You have to spell it out, H-I. Then you write it down, two letters, space those letters by a hair, and then when you're done, somebody looks at it and goes, hi. And then you get to continue to the next word. Think about that. And this is the reason, because there were scribes, there were writers, there were people that took this so Seriously, that they felt the need to make sure 
that A's didn't look like O's and I's did not look like L's or whatever else. B's didn't look like D's. There could not be any mistake. If you had two corrections on the page, you're okay, but three corrections meant the page had to be burned in the fire and you had to start over. And I'm sure after a while they'd be like, listen, you're not a very good scribe. You just need to go home. But this is why. This is the reason, because we have this historical understanding of how the word of God was preserved. We have this confidence knowing that, you know what, how would you ever mess up a letter or a word with this sort of stringent rule set? This is how they wrote it. Did you also know that the Bible is not written, or the Bible is not structured in chronological order? Genesis is actually not the very first book of the Bible on the timeline of humanity. Do you know that? Anybody not know that before? A couple people. The Bible was not written chronologically. Genesis, historically, based on the year that it was written, is not the oldest. Anybody know what the oldest is? It's Job. The book of Job is the oldest. And we actually get the book of Job like, you know, kind of mid-Old Testament, but historically it's actually the oldest. But it's structured in that way. If you've never read the Bible chronologically, that's a great place to kind of gain insight and understand the timeline of how things worked out in the Bible. It will help you understand the order in which things happened, especially regarding the historical books of the epistles. And I close with this tonight. And I'll just, music, you can stay down. We don't need to close with music tonight. But from the beginning of this lesson, we have seen that, that, we have seen that sources both inside and outside the Bible confirm the good book that we hold in our hands, that we hide in our hearts, and this is the inspired word of God. We have seen, we can understand how the Bible was written by so many men And yet it is without contradiction. Again, over 40 authors that were God-inspired, but they do not contradict one another. They do not say things. They do not write things that go against what somebody else wrote down in the Scripture. And we see, based on what we just talked about with the scribes, how it was preserved and it was saved for us to be able to read the Word of God in our day. And since the Bible is the Word of God, we can trust its principles and its commandments with our very soul. The Bible is the inspired word of God. Look at your neighbor and say, the Bible is the inspired word of God. It really is, as complex as some of these things may be, it really is that simple. And you can have confidence every time that you pick up your Bible. Every time you go on your phone, and maybe that's how you like to read it digitally, every time that you're reading those verses, just know that each and every word, think about it, each and every word is there on purpose. Each and every word got the stamp of approval of God, and he allowed it to be in there for a reason. Even, even I'm sure if you study deep enough, even like the weird, crazy stories of the Bible, right? It's, it's Elijah, right? The kids make fun of him. Am I right on this? Right? You you ever heard this story before? The kids, they see Elijah the prophet, and they're making fun of his bald head, and so he prays, and a bear comes and kills the kids. I don't know why it's in there, but what I can tell you, based on everything that we just covered, that you know what? God was like, that needs to be in there. People need to know that you can't make fun of prophets with no hair. Okay? So if you didn't learn anything else tonight, just know that if you see somebody that operates in the prophetic, and they don't have any hair, keep your mouth shut, and you'll be around longer. It's a true story. True story. Why don't we all stand together? And I'm just going to close us in prayer tonight. It is 7.59, so we are right on schedule. And uh, why don't you pray with me tonight? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word in a very meaningful sense tonight because, Lord, we uh, know and we can understand through what we have covered tonight through scriptural reference but also through historical records that this is the divinely inspired word of God. And every time we pick it up, we are reading God-breathed, God-authored words. And so, Lord, I just pray tonight that through this even basic, so fundamental and baseline understanding that it's so important to each and every one of us to understand why we believe what we believe, which is what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. 
God, that we would understand and look at this word. God, that we would adhere and and take hold of this word and understand that we're not just reading another book and these aren't just other words and this just isn't something we do to check the box of our day. But God, this is your word that you want to speak to us and minister to us through. And so, Lord, I pray over the next week that we will be challenged by this and understand how powerful your word is. God, I pray that uh, you would go with us tonight. I thank you for this time that we have had together. And, Lord, I pray for every young person that was in this room tonight, God, that you would create windows of opportunity for them to talk to somebody who is broken, destitute, and hurting. God, I pray that we would grow in our faith and continue to walk in the fullness of what you have in our lives. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your attention tonight, and thank you for being here. God bless. Uh, Keep an eye on social media for the events that we've got coming up later this month in the October Youth Retreat sign-up. Let's turn on some music. We've got some time to hang out. Talk to somebody you haven't talked to in a while. God bless you. We will see you on Friday for prayer meeting. We'll see you on Friday for prayer.